you, Mark. You've been, uh, you've been diligent and uh, effective and also uh, efficient. Um, we now turn to Mr. Alan Marks. Uh, Mr. Marks is an is a, uh, is a attorney who works and practices in the area of finance for energy projects now, and global project finance in general. Uh, so he knows where the money is and how it gets to where people want it to go. And he also knows the deficiencies in the, in the system in terms of how money could get allocated or, or what kinds of constraints it has. So I think Alan will give us a vision of the lifeblood of commerce and the world economic system, which is money. Go ahead. Thank you, Kimball. I uh, appreciate that. It's a gracious introduction, and it's an honor to be here uh, with all of you today. And I would also say it's an honor to be back at the United Nations. I started about 20, a little over 25 years ago as an intern at UNIDO in Vienna, working it was then called the Special Advisory Group on Energy, looking at two innovative ideas, industrial energy efficiency and cogeneration. Uh, and I thought to myself as I put together these slides, global energy solutions, that's ambitious. What's slide two going to say? How, how do we solve all the world's problems in energy in, in 15 minutes? And I thought, well, what's changed since I was at UNIDO 25 years ago? Well, for one thing, the world has had tremendous and wide-ranging economic prosperity and development. Poverty has been alleviated all over the world. Not everywhere. There is still huge amounts of work to be done. We saw earlier today 1.6 billion people lack water. And it's going to take energy as well as other things to solve those kinds of problems. But compared to 25 years ago, the kinds of problems we're talking about now and the number of countries or member states in the UN that are looking at how to deal with sustainable development with relatively advanced economies uh, is, I think, remarkable and quite a, quite a strong human accomplishment. Uh, what else has changed? Well, the way we use energy, uh, it's interesting. If you dig down in the industrial sector, energy efficiency really has been tremendously successful. And today, the industrial sector is fairly efficient around most of the world. The residential sector is not. And with increasing wealth, it is uh, actually becoming much more energy intense, uh, and there's still a lot of work to be done there. Uh, and the transportation sector has become the big dark hole where uh, so much energy waste is, is occurring. It's not entirely the fault of energy technology or transportation technology. It's frankly a land use problem. As you see increasing urbanization, uh, and, and degradation of lands in emerging markets and increasing suburban uh, and, and urban sprawl and low density patterns of growth in the uh, OECD countries in the last 25 years, it's not a big surprise we've ended up where we are. So how do we solve this problem? Uh, 15 minutes from now, maybe we'll know. I'd like to very quickly look first at some of the drivers that are favoring green energy, and I will identify three in particular. Uh, show you a little bit about the sources of capital for energy project development worldwide. Uh, I have several slides with the time we have, I will actually have to skip a few of them, looking at a snapshot of, mark, of the project finance market for energy and some of the trends uh, that we have to meet what are huge global energy infrastructure needs. And at the end, I'll talk of, just for a brief moment about the impact of a global recession and what's next in the uh, nearer term. The three major drivers for green energy, as I see it at the moment worldwide, are first public policy. Because of environmental issues and concerns, uh, energy security concerns, there is a, uh, a, a growing, I'd say both in breadth and depth, consensus uh, among government leaders at all levels, from local to international, that something needs to be done uh, and green energy has become popular uh, again and maybe more than ever. Second, rising commodity costs uh, have been a factor. Now, clearly, with the recession and demand coming down uh, and increased supplies, for example, of natural gas, uh, uh, we're not seeing all of those prices sustained. But if you compare it historically over the last, say, 30, 40 years, uh, those commodity costs are going up. And when coal, gas, and oil become relatively more expensive, uh, if you combine that with technological innovation, bringing down the cost of renewables, renewables can now compete. And that is certainly uh, something which has changed. Let's drill down a little closely uh, into each of these. For public policy, uh, I, I mentioned that the energy sector and its development is critical to alleviating poverty and to en encouraging uh, growth in, in countries of all levels of economic development. GDP per capita cannot go up unless there's more energy use 
or at least more efficient and wiser energy use. Uh, either one will do. Ideally, you'll have both. Uh, secondly, rising global standards of living have created an environmentally minded middle class. That's another reason you're seeing such a wider uh, consensus forming on the need for uh, uh, greener and cleaner energy, what I like to call keeping the lights on and the skies blue. Now, there is not the same consensus on paying for it or who will share the burden of it, but there is a consensus that something needs to be done. And lastly, global climate change is certainly creating a new sense of urgency about this. It's not enough to say we need to do this over the next 50 or 100 years. Uh, it, there's actually some uh, growing, I think large growing uh, consensus that time is of the essence. Second point I'd like to make, I don't think there's such a thing as a private uh, or purely private or a free market in energy anywhere in the world. We could waste a lot of time today arguing whether there should be, but that's, that's going to miss the point. The fact is energy markets are to a varying degree increasingly global and are very much influenced by governmental policies, national policies and international policies. Those policies can either encourage technological innovation of certain types and encourage uh, relatively efficient allocations through market mechanisms of resources, or they can discourage and impede them. And quite often, I think if you look at any particular blend of policies uh, on any national level, you will find that there's a tendency to put the, the one foot firmly on the gas pedal and one on the brake at exactly the same time. Mm -hmm. And we, we do this within the energy area. We also do it across areas where you look at agricultural policy, transportation policy, housing policy, uh, and all the rest as it, as it impacts energy. Uh, the other thing to, to point out is this is not a static system. We're not going to magically reach an equilibrium where we've done the right thing and we're done. Instead, because technology is, 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 is uh, receiving capital and innovation is occurring, there are changes in what capital markets will do and the governments react. And then the governments have mandates and incentives and subsidies and try to push us in certain ways and the markets react and technology reacts as well. Uh, if you put a price on carbon uh, and you subsidize wind and solar, you'll see different types of innovation. Uh, if you have government R&D grants for batteries and energy storage technologies, you'll see different types of innovation. If you have liability shields for nuclear power development, you'll have different types of innovation. Uh, all these things can either be reinforced or impeded by government policy. And this wheel will keep spinning, hopefully in a good direction. Uh, I'd like to skip the competing resource slides in the interest of time for a moment and look at technological innovation. As I mentioned, wind energy, wind energy I think is probably a, a very good paradigm uh, for the, what I'll call the uh, increasing efficiency or productivity curve of different types of technologies to generate power. Uh, if you look at the economies of scale, uh, the efficiency and the reliability of wind turbine generators today and compare it to the market 25 years ago, uh, this, has be this is the reason why wind uh, unit costs for, for energy from wind generating plants has come down uh, as fast and as far as it has and why these are now uh, very competitive in many parts of the world, uh, even if they don't have as high a subsidy as they may have needed to get to this point economically, and even if the wind resource is not uh, the optimal or the best site. Solar energy and solar power, uh, whether it's solar thermal or uh, concentrated solar, traditional PV, any of them, uh, they, they are, they're moving along the same curve, but they're at an earlier stage. So the unit costs are still very high. Now, we're starting to see consolidation combined with innovation where capital is being pooled to uh, drive down the costs, especially of manufacturing the components and of making the particular technologies, the inverters, the panels, the tracking systems, uh, more effective and more efficient. Uh, reliability has not historically been as big a problem as it was for wind. Uh, but all of these things are helping. And of course, it's advances in material science and, and, uh, and the rest that are going to continue that. Uh, and their government subsidies probably do play a good role in helping to move us along that curve to bring down the cost to make it economically efficient to, um, to build up solar capacity uh, globally. Uh, nuclear power has been mentioned. Uh, I think it's certainly uh, uh, safer than it was, largely because of innovation. Uh, and we can't just look at generation of power. 
uh, we have to look at the technologies being applied to in, uh, more wisely use power. Energy efficiency, of course, but also energy storage solutions, uh, smart grids and enhanced distribution networks, all the things that can help us shave the peak and use energy more wisely uh, displace the need to build additional capacity. No one of these things is sufficient. We have to do all of them. And the, the capital will be attracted to the ones where the rewards and the risks balance out in the ways that are most attractive to the investors. What are the sources of capital right now for energy project development? Uh, here, of course, a big distinction between the venture capital or early stage capital that's going into technologies uh, before they're scaled up or marketed uh, versus the money which is being used to actually build the uh, power generating stations, the utility scale distribution networks, uh, and, and all the rest. In general, if an energy investment, a power plant or anything, uh, has speculative revenues or costs associated with it, or if it relies on newer uh, technology, then it's going to be riskier and you'll need more equity and less debt there will be a higher cost of capital involved. And in the extreme, this is the area where government subsidies or incentives could be actually quite useful in stimulating investment or incentivizing co-lending or co-investing by the private sector that would not otherwise occur. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, where projects have lower credit risk with more predictable revenues and costs, proven technology, they can attract more debt. And that higher debt capacity can yield higher returns on the equity which is invested uh, those are the projects which are absolutely privately financeable, even in today's recession-wracked credit markets. For governments to put money into those projects is a waste of resources uh, and it's not necessary. And, and I think a lot of our policies don't make this distinction. We tend to have policies that skew where the government money is going and it's not being used to the best advantage, which is to mobilize even more private capital to go into um, uh, economically feasible projects. Where's the money coming from? 